Hello, everybody. A warm welcome from Dubai to the next panel. A very important conversation, not just around the ongoing vaccination rollout globally, but also the investment landscape more broadly. I want to get to our next panelist, that is the CEO of the Russian Direct Investment Fund, the RDIF, that is Kirill Dmitriev. Uh, Kirill, let's start with Sputnik V. I mean, when uh, sort of it first was put into production, it was a part of a big idea, a big vision to put Russia on the map of a global vaccination drive. When we last caught up over the summer, you said, hey, we're going to reach 800 million doses by the year end. Are you still on track for that? Yes, Joseph, thank you so much. And uh, first of all, I'd like to stress that it is indeed a very joint struggle of uh, every country, including Russia, fighting with the virus. You know, we are fighting with it together and we are bringing to this fight our 250 years of vaccine experience in Russia. Uh, and we are on track to uh, our target, maybe will be delayed by two, three weeks, but we are ramping up production significantly. And what benefits us uh, is that already 24 production partners of RDIF in 13 different countries are already producing Sputnik V and Sputnik Light vaccine as we speak. And this partnership approach that Russia demonstrated enabling different countries to have production of Sputnik V enables us to ramp up production quite quickly. So we'll be producing more than 100 million uh, doses, including Sputnik Light in October. We'll be increasing production more in November, and by November, more than 50% uh, of Sputnik V and Sputnik Light will be produced outside of Russia. Uh, there have been some supply issues, especially with the second dose of what is a two-dose vaccine. Uh, complaints from Brazil and Guatemala. There was a scathing letter from Argentina that made headlines just a few weeks ago. Uh, how can you reassure them today about some of the promised deliveries? Well, they are already reassured because we caught up with the second component delivery. And just as uh, all of the other producers have had some delays, there were some delays with second component, but they have been resolved uh, in all of the countries already by now. Uh, we delivered more than 7 million second component uh, over the last couple of weeks. So those issues have been uh, resolved. And what's very important is that actually the first component of Sputnik V we call it Sputnik Light, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, produces better protection than many of the two-shot vaccines. And we'll share unique data next week that against Delta variant, and this is, I'm telling it you to you for the first time, the Sputnik Light produces better protection than most two-shot vaccines. So when we delivered first shot to all those countries, and you see Argentina cases, by the way, declining 30 times, <laughs> over the last four months. Really, it's a huge success story for Sputnik V because Sputnik yeah. V really contributed to a very successful vaccination program. And unlike some surges you see in some of the Western countries that did not use Sputnik, Argentina shows that using Sputnik has really stopped uh, the epidemic uh, and the numbers uh, sort of demonstrate that. So would you consider Sputnik like then a new generation, a new version, sort of a 2.0 that maybe has improvements in the, in the second dose portion of this two-dose vaccine process? Is that a, an accurate way to describe it? Well, Sputnik Light is a very important initiative. It's just our first dose, uh, and we just saw that first dose produces great effectiveness. So it's 80%, more than 80% effective as a standalone vaccine. Actually, Paraguay study showed efficacy of more than 93% as a standalone vaccine. But this is also vaccines that can be a booster to other vaccines. So it's a standalone vaccine and a booster. And frankly, it's the first booster registered in the world because we understood that boosters uh, are needed. So we are testing this booster with AstraZeneca combination, with Sinopharm combination, with Moderna combination in Argentina. And we believe that eventually it's a combination of the vaccines, including adding Sputnik Light booster, that can be the ultimate yeah. solution against many of the existing uh, and emerging mutations. Can you shed a little bit more light on any of the real world data that you've been able to gather? Because you've deployed your vaccine to millions more people around the globe. You have probably a much better idea today of where effectiveness stands compared to where it was three, six, nine, or maybe a year ago. Where are we? 85, 75? You know, does it vary even geographically? What are you seeing? 
Thank you, Yosef. And yes, yeah, so first of all, the benefit of Sputnik, it's already registered in 70 countries with 4 billion people representing half of the world population. And we have data from tens and hundreds of millions of people. So basically, we have real data from 15 countries that has been published already in 20 publications. And what this real data shows is an incredibly safe profile of the vaccine. So it has the least side effects based on Mexican data. Uh, what's very important, it doesn't show a track record of some of the rare cases that some other vaccines are having of myocarditis and CVT, cerebral venous thrombosis, so we don't have that. So it's a very safe platform, by the way, that showed historically safety over long term, which is very important. On, on yeah. the efficacy, we see efficacy against Delta of 83.1% for Sputnik V against infection and more than 94% against hospitalization. So the key for us, Sputnik is very effective against Delta, and it shows in all of the clinical real-world data. And very importantly, mm -hmm. we don't see major decline in the effectiveness. Actually, right. Argentina study showed the effectiveness of Sputnik increases over a period of four or five months, while for some of the other vaccines, it actually decreases. I mean, here's the issue, Carol, because I listened to all the progress you've been able to make, and uh, you know, you're describing it as positive, as sort of new milestones, as moving away from some of the difficulties of the early beginnings, as it were. Why then hasn't the WHO signed off on, on all of this? When are they going to come on board? Well, we are in the process with WHO, with Emma, and they've been very professional, and they do all of their, uh, you know, steps, uh, sometimes bureaucratic steps, that I needed. Our Ministry of Health confirmed that, you know, all of the barriers have been removed, and we believe there will be a visit of WHO soon in October to Russia. But very importantly is that the vaccine has been not only approved by 70 regulators, <laughs> but it has been used on 10 million people and showed one of the safest and most efficient uh, profiles. So we have no doubt of WHO approval. They just need to go through their emotions. And I think it's very important that this vaccine already has been used very actively in the world. And we expect WHO, by the way, to also separate vaccine approval, which is a very important track, but also work on vaccine certificate acceptance around the world. Because it's yeah. very important while bureaucracy continues to work on vaccine approval, vaccine certificates are interchangeable and accepted around the world. And that's a very important track that we believe is important to resume the world travel. Uh, do you have any capacity to get into some new agreements to uh, spread out the vaccination rollout as we get into 2022? What are some of the other countries that you're speaking to? Or are you pretty much, uh, you know, you've got your orders full and your hands tied at this point? Well, I think we really recognize our sort of role. We want to make a contribution, but we definitely have no production capacity to be the uh, vaccine for the world. So we believe vaccine uh, portfolio is the answer for the world because you cannot bet on just one technology. You see some fortunes of technologies go up and down, some declines in efficacy over five months to below 50%. So vaccine technology landscape is changing. And the only way to feel secure is to have a portfolio of different vaccines that we believe Sputnik can be part of. So we want to make a contribution. We are not trying to get a huge market share. Each country we go to, we say we do not want to be more than 20% of your total vaccine supply agreement because, frankly, we have demand significantly uh, overstripping our uh, supply. So we'll be working with existing countries, trying to make contributions. Sputnik already is the main vaccine for vaccination in Russia, and we just want to work with others, be a partner with others, and work in a positive partnership manner with other vaccine producers as well. How much progress have you been able to make domestically? There was uh, quite a bit of criticism coming across in terms of how the initial rollout was handled. There was hesitancy and reluctance on part of major parts and portions of the population. Uh, where do we stand today? Well, uh, first of all, Sputnik is definitely accepted as the most popular vaccine in Russia. And uh, already almost 50% of the population has been vaccinated. Now we want to have, of course, higher vaccination rates. And frankly, Russia has been a little bit of victim of its own success because it handled the initial stage of epidemic very well. So when Delta uh, came in, many people didn't really realize how serious uh, you know, COVID is. But now vaccination rates are increasing and definitely Sputnik is a big part uh, of that. So we believe that vaccination rates in Russia will continue to increase. Uh, and Sputnik, of course, is the core part, the main part of the vaccination program in Russia. 
I want to sort of get to a bit of an overview on what is happening in the investment landscape. But you have, of course, teams that are working across the world to try and find opportunities. But just in terms of the state of the global economy, a fragile uh, recovery post COVID, uh, what is your read on the situation at the moment? Okay, I'll go there in just one second. Let me give you just one thought that I think is important on the vaccine and we'll finish with the vaccine stuff. Because I think one initiative that I would like to propose again for the first time given this conference is that we believe it's very important to have much more of a direct comparison of different vaccines. So for example, what we are doing with Argentina, we have combo trials of Sputnik with AstraZeneca, with Moderna, with Sinopharm, and it's all compared on the same data set on the same population. So I think one initiative that we'd like to outline is that there should be more direct comparison of how vaccines work with new mutations and not just have data from different countries, but have it all in the same place. But going on to the vaccine landscape, I think it's very important to recognize the reality is that first of all, I think the great news is that many people were afraid that pandemic will really destroy economies, but the world has recovered. Many economies are recovering and that's great news. I think also the cost of this is huge inflation. <laughs> and we see that almost 40% of new money has been printed by some economies. We see major inflationary pressures in agriculture and natural resources. So the question is how do you basically preserve wealth in this high inflation environment? And we believe there are several answers to this. One is private markets. So we believe that public markets, you know, really very high valuations. So private markets uh, is the way to go. Of course, technology will play a huge role, artificial intelligence, genetics, and of course, by the way, Moderna stocks uh, and other stocks have showed the great promise uh, of, of technology, but again, they're public stocks now, and we believe that they're quite fairly valued, and definitely natural resources. So Russia, as uh, you know, an owner of a big part of world natural resources, will definitely benefit yeah. from the high inflation uh, environment. Right. I want to just uh, build on what you just said in terms of the inflationary pressure that you're seeing across supply chains. It's something that we talk on Bloomberg TV about a lot with some of the CEOs and the leading officials. Uh, but are you able to do anything to mitigate some of those pressures or are you going to have to pass these on, these costs on to consumers? Uh, I mean, how, how big a change are you seeing and how much does it affect what RDIF does day to day? Sure. So our benefit is that we have a network of partners who are the top sovereign wealth fund partners in the world. And all of them are concerned now <laughs> about preserving and increasing the wealth, given that valuations are so high. And the question is, do we go into public markets and then possibly have some risk or how do we deal with this? So we have big discussions about what actually preserves value uh, in the new environment. I think uh, initially there was lots of value to be captured through technology stocks. And this is why, you know, lots of value has been uh, sort of going to technology stocks. Uh, there are lots of things that we are doing in infrastructure investing and basically making infrastructure investments that are inflation protected. Uh, and also investments in agriculture, natural resources, sort of by definition, are uh, investment protected uh, in, in, in investments. So we are looking for pockets uh, of such investments and basically investment protection from inflation, I believe, is one of the core themes for many people to think about. Now, the problem when many people with lots of money think about that, it leads to more inflation. Yeah. So this is something the world has to work through. So what exactly are the geographic priorities here? Where are we going to see the RDIF do more deals? So we, of course, invest quite a bit in Russia, and Russia is about 80% of our investment uh, mandate, and uh, we see actually quite low multiples uh, in Russia because of a number of historical reasons, of a number of perceived risks that are out there. So we actually believe that Russian public market has still some ways to go and Russian companies represent very attractive uh, investment opportunities. But we're also investing in China. We have been investing in the Middle East and Europe. And uh, once again, the benefit is that we have more than 20 partners in different countries. So we try to either make Russian companies more global by partnering with them or investing in opportunities that our partners offer and bringing those opportunities to Russia. Uh, Carol, it's been, what, about six months, a bit more than that, since the new U.S. administration under President Joe Biden has taken over. They've kind of found their feet. Um, I'm wondering whether you're seeing potential here of a shift away from what was quite an acrimonious relationship with the United States, between the United States and Russia, and whether there is a window of opportunity for some kind of rapprochement that would help ease some of the sanctions. 
Well, yes, uh, yes, thank you. I think the world will definitely benefit from a better relations between U.S. and Russia on the uh, economic side and on geopolitical side. And I think what has been positive are some of the direct conversation that President Biden and President Putin have been having. So this communication, this really uh, open discussion of issues, I think is very important as you know, foundation uh, of a relationship. And I think also there should be more interaction between Russian and U.S. business that can provide more of a framework of also discussions. So not only the difficult geopolitical questions I discussed, but ways to really invest together and do things together. So we are quite hopeful uh, that those direct discussions are creating the foundation of a better relationship. Russia has always been open to a better relationship. You know, we want to be partner with many countries in the world. So let's see how it emerges. I think it's great if US and Russian business can play their role to make relationship uh, better and make relationship more economic and business focused as well. A closing question on your biggest concern outside of some of the material that we've discussed. Uh, is there another risk factor, you know, be it perhaps instability in China on the economic front with the Evergrande debt saga or another pocket of the world where you see uh, the potential of quite a bit of derailing of sentiment and confidence? Well, I think a big situation to watch is the gas prices in Europe. And uh, Russia is interested in stable energy prices. You know, we played a big role in stabilizing oil prices to avoid fluctuations. So many people would think those uh, things benefit Russia. But the reality, uh, we believe that long-term supply contracts are a way to solve some of the energy issues. And I think energy shock can be quite significant. And in addition to energy shocks, of course, you know, there are bio-risks, terrorist risks. But we believe that you know, transition to green energy, but in a meaningful way, is the best way to go to avoid energy shocks. Kirill, this has been a real pleasure and always is. Thank you for making the time and for sharing some of your views with our global audience. That is uh, Kirill Dimitriev. He's the CEO at the RDIF. Thank you again. Thank you, Yosef. Thank you very much.